Hey everyone, welcome to the show. I'm here today with Jeremy Dalton. Jeremy, thank you for being here. How are you? Real pleasure to be here, Sanj. Yeah, really, really good. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Pleasure's all mine. So uh, a quick introduction uh, to Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy, most most recently, uh, you've had 10 years at PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, I think when we first met, it was maybe about six years ago when you were an innovation manager there at the time. You've had various leadership roles uh, uh, since then. You are now um, a VR and AR specialist and the head of XR there. You're involved in many organizations in this field. You're, th you're seen as a thought leader in this field. You're also the author of an amazing new book called Reality Check, which is just over you behind your left, left shoulder, which we're going to talk about later. Um, today, we're going to discuss um, the business and developer opportunities uh, in XR. So firstly, for the uninitiated who may be very well aware of what uh, VR, virtual reality and AR augmented reality are, what is XR? So it's there are lots of confusing terms out there in the, in the industry, so I can understand the, the question. XR is, is basically an umbrella term that covers augmented reality and virtual reality. Now, some people say the X stand is just a variable that could stand for anything. Others believe it's an acronym that stands for extended reality. It doesn't really matter. Uh, for me, it's just a convenient way of bunching together um, what uh, virtual reality and augmented reality and uh, bringing together this, this field of spatial computing into a nice short acronym. Reality Check. This is a brilliant book, and I'm saying that genuinely. I have nothing to gain from from, from saying this. Uh, I've I've started reading it. I, I'm really enjoying it. You go into a lot of depth and a lot of detail about virtually everything there is to know about VR and AR, and you you answer a lot of the questions that businesses and individuals may have, and you back that all up with a lot of uh, data and facts, and it's it's very to the point. Um, and it's really good. So congratulations. Well done. Thank you so um, much. What can you tell me about the history behind this book? Because this must have been like a massive endeavor. So where does it come from and how, how do you squeeze this out? It certainly was. I don't, I don't think I would have been able to squeeze it out without the pressure of a <laughs> publishing deadline. <laughs> so I signed, I signed a, a contract in uh, September 2019 with my publisher, Kogan Page, and they specialize in, in business, uh, business related books. And they wanted something to be done on, on virtual reality and augmented reality. So they came to me and asked if I was willing to do it. I knew it would be a big under, undertaking. So I thought about it for a bit, uh, but then decided it was too big of an opportunity not to, not to, uh, uh, to take on. So I, say, I said to myself, well, whatever's coming, I'm just going to agree to it and I'll figure out the rest later. And that was quite a painful process, it turns out. <laughs> 12 months later, um, the book was delivered. In the middle of that, we had the whole COVID pandemic. So February 2020, it all kicked off uh, here in the UK, at least. And um, there were all sorts of obstacles that that caused, in addition to the usual obstacles that come with a book writing project. But it was definitely a rewarding exercise. I, I've really... I can't say I necessarily enjoyed the process all the time. There were very, very long nights, early mornings, weekends, in the entirety of weekends, morning to evening. I took time off you know, from work to do it. I wrote over Christmas. I wrote over the New Year. I wrote over the Easter period. Uh, it was just writing, 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 and researching, researching, researching. Um, but the, the end result has been really, uh, really rewarding. I've been really happy that it's been well received in the market. That's probably a bit of an understatement. I mean, you've got like uh, great reviews on Amazon and uh, everywhere else it's it's available. And like I say, it really is a very thorough and complete book. It, you answer virtually any question you can have around VR and AR. You know where it comes from, Sanj? It comes from the, the experiences that I had in my role leading the XR team at PwC. I would talk to clients all the time and I would I would very quickly realize that they thought of virtual reality and augmented reality as this sort of fun technology that really didn't have any business ramifications. And, and, and I can understand why. You look at the media and you've got articles like Pokemon Go. Somebody's you know, about to walk off a cliff while playing their Pokemon Go on their phone. You've got articles about uh, Brie Larson playing Beat Saber on uh, The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. All really fun and entertaining stuff. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the poor old business world, uh, nobody really cares if uh, 
if DHL increase, increases efficiency in their warehouse operations by, you know, 15, 20 percent, it's just not really an exciting story. But it does have incredible potential for business. And, and that's part of the, my motivation for, uh, for writing the book was that experience. What can you tell me? Because I know you've written about uh, some of the um, the gains that business can g- businesses can get in terms of training, operation, sales, and marketing. I had to think about how to split this up in the book because there are so many applications of the technology in many different areas, and you can cut it by industry. But there are there'll be lots of duplicate applications within those different industries. So if I take collaboration, for example. You can use virtual reality or augmented reality to bring people from around the world together in this virtual environment and have them feel like they are they are sharing the same experience, like they're face to face almost. And uh, and as a result, you can have a much more effective form of uh, of collaboration and working together. And and this is not something that's a potential for the future. It's something that's happening right now. We're dealing with with clients all over the world and and facilitating these virtual collaboration events and sessions and workshops with them. We've got 250 headsets this week that are going out uh, on a large project to bring those business leaders from all over the world together, which is super exciting. But collaboration is just the the tip of the iceberg, and that's one area within within operations. The other areas are um, in visualizing assets and environments. So thinking about it, how you could travel to a completely different uh, space, time, location around the world. And there may be many reasons for doing that. You may be, and this is a real example, you may want to consider purchasing, you know, or taking a minority stake in, in the organization, but you want to review their operations. You want to review their space. Uh, you want to review their um, their different uh, plots and sites around the world. Very difficult to do that and manage that by visiting it physically, but very easy to do it when you are, or relatively more easy to do it when you are doing it through virtual reality. So environments and, and asset visualization is another big area. And on that same concept, you've got this visualization of, of utilities. And the reason I bring this up is because it's an area that if you think about it, is, is actually quite intriguing. No matter where we walk on the streets, there is this network or array of underground gas pipes, ele- electric lines, um, network and, and uh, telecommunications infrastructure, uh, all this sort of stuff. It's an entire subterranean world uh, beneath us that we never really think about because it's out of sight. But it's incredibly important for keeping the world going. And often maintenance procedures need to be done. They need to be dug up. Construction work needs to be done and needs to be managed around it. But how do you avoid what is potentially a life-threatening situation where if a construction worker hits a gas pipe, it can cause a massive explosion that can kill people. And it has done in the past. If you had a better way of visualizing that entire underground environment, then you'd be in a much better position to avoid those those terrible um, and, and errors that cost human lives. And you can do that with augmented reality. So you think about um, wearing a, a head-mounted display or even using your, your mobile phone or tablet. And in fact, actually, I'll go reach over to one of the ones I have here and, uh, and show you. This is a uh, Microsoft HoloLens 2. And you oh, can cool. see it's, uh, it's an augmented reality headset. You can see through the pane of glass here. And um, if you can imagine a construction worker or field engineer wearing this headset and it overlaying on the ground in front of them, that network of cables and pipes and so on, that's pretty amazing. Um, And it does allow you to conduct your operations in a far more error-free fashion. But again, there are so many examples that it's being used in forensic visualization uh, to, to prosecute Nazis. Uh, and war criminals. It's being used in sales and marketing as a new research tool, a sales avenue, a different advertising channel and marketing medium. Um, And to bring that to life, if you as a consumer take your mobile phone 
and you bring to life a product that you've been browsing on on a company's website, you can actually bring that into the real world. Put that product, whether it's a laptop or a, a kitchen mixer or anything like that, onto the kitchen counter or table in front of you. And that allows you to visualize that asset in a much more um, impactful way that actually results in increased conversion for sales. So really good uh, sales and marketing tool there. But hopefully that gives you um, an idea of the, the breadth of, of applications that this technology has across different industries. Businesses really do have an opportunity here to be on the forefront of this innovation, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't matter whether it's a, whether you've got a small business, a large business, medium-sized business, whatever industry you're in, there is an application of virtual reality and augmented reality that will probably make sense and probably provide you with some sort of business value, whether that is you trying to increase your your revenue or create new sales or, and revenue channels, decrease costs, increase efficiencies within the organization, simplify things, um, or functionally specific benefits like within your learning and development team, for example, uh, in terms of increasing knowledge retention, creating more focus on your learning and development programs and areas like that. And you can go through the chain on the different functions and pick out different areas where virtual reality and augmented reality can help improve the organization. The training piece uh, that you write about in your book, I find really interesting, but uh, if people want to know about that, they'll have to go buy your book. <laughs> um, you mentioned it there that you know businesses now are able to actually see a return on their investment uh, when using XR technologies. The hardware is very much available now, very quite affordable. Is there, I mean, there, some people would still be concerned about the long, longevity of, of this technology. Do we feel like we've crossed that threshold now and we can give some assurance that it's here to stay? Yeah, I mean, I can understand the, the skepticism towards it. If you think about it, you know, this is not the first time that we've tried to bring virtual reality and augmented reality into the market. Specifically talking about virtual reality, it has been around for a very, very long time. So you can, you can take this, you can take this quite far back, but um, let's, let's stop at the 1800s, okay? In the 1800s, <laughs> <laughs> believe me, you can go much further back than that. All right, go on. <laughs> but in the 1800s, you had, first of all, panoramic paintings, right? These floor to ceiling paintings, 10, 20 meters across. And the idea of them being so massive, so lar larger than life, is that you could stand in front of them and feel like you were in that scene that the artist had painted. And to be honest, that concept, the idea of being immersed in a completely different world, that is exactly the same concept that we're pursuing nowadays, just with different technology, like um, like the virtual reality headsets you see here. And they're using digital, uh, digital for medium instead of the medium of paint back then. But if we look at something like this, you've got, you know, the Google Cardboard that's been around for the last few years. If you if you go back to the Victorian times, they had a device which looked really similar, similar to that. And it was called the stereoscope. It had two lenses. Uh, it didn't have a it didn't run off a mobile phone, of course, but it ran off a slide. So you would have a card which had two images on it. You'd slide the card in front of the lenses. You would put the device to your face and you'd have a view, uh, you'd be immersed in a different world represented by the pictures on those cards. Again, mm. same idea we're trying, to, we're trying to create here with virtual reality, except we're using digital technology for that. So virtual reality has been around for a while. In digital format, it's been here since the 1960s. And uh, there've been a lot of experiments that went on um, in, in MIT with even Sutherland, with the US military, with NASA and so on. Um, but then it really started to to become a, an item in the the mainstream population's mind in the late 80s, early 90s. Now, if anyone remembers being in a virtual reality headset back then, there were there were lots of opportunities to do so. Uh, they were these really hefty devices, bulky, heavy, had an octopus of cables sticking out of them, cost loads of money. We're talking about. Uh, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a piece, that sort of range, and um, it was the experience you got at the end of it. Were, well, if you remember the graphics of the time, they were pretty pixelated. 
Um, so not as inspiring and, and, and awesome as the, the graphics that we have nowadays. And we lack the processing power. So that caused problems with cyber sickness. There are all sorts of issues. And so virtual reality didn't really catch on. It kind of um, went into hibernation mode, only to be resurrected in this latest era around 2012, when a chap called Palmer Lucky put uh, his device, the Oculus Rift the DK1, on Kickstarter and asked for $240,000. In return, we gave him $2.5 million to bring that product to life. And that got everyone really excited. In 2014, Facebook buys Oculus for $3 billion. And then you have all these manufacturers here, HTC, um, Oculus, um, of course, you've got PlayStation, Sony. Um, but this is the device that, uh, that kicked it all off, yeah. This is the um, the the DK the Oculus DK one which went on wow. Kickstarter back in 2012 um, as a development kit, hence the DK uh, notation. Um, but amazing to to think how far this device has come technologically uh, since then. Um, the reason to get back to your question though, and the reason for this context, virtual reality has been around for a while in one form or another. But the reason why now is the right time for this technology is because it's become cost effective for the end user. So these sort of headsets, they're now being sold in the market, you know, in stores, uh, on Amazon, places like that for $299. And um, that at that price point, it can be afforded by the mainstream market. So from a price perspective, the price is right. The processing power that we have in place now allows for a good experience and in a lot of cases, a fantastic experience. Uh, so we have the graphical processing power to manage that. Then you have the user experience. It's become really or far simpler to use virtual reality than it ever has been before. Even just a few years ago, you had to have a really powerful computer. You had to plug the device in. You'd have to have external peripherals that scanned you and detected where you were in the, in the physical world so it could emulate your movements in the virtual world. Um, those needed power. Uh, the, he the, the computer you needed to buy needed to be powerful. You had to have a whole uh, string of cables for the, the visual aspects, the data, the power. And so it was complicated, right? Whereas nowadays, you just have a single headset uh, like this. doesn't need any extra peripherals. You do have controllers that you can use uh, for them. But even then, uh, you've got native hand tracking now, so your hands can actually be used as, as controller inputs itself. So it's the whole system has become very, very much simplified from where it was even just a few years ago and certainly more than a few decades ago. So for all these reasons, we're now seeing a uh, all the factors that are in place to make virtual reality a viable tool in the modern day. You know, when you said 1800s, I thought, wow, he's, he's really stretching himself there. But, uh, <laughs> I think he nailed it. <laughs> It's, it's amazing if you, if you think about the whole concept, you know, you don't think about the technology. Not, it's not about screens. It's not about, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the sort of smart look of it, the cameras on the front of it. Think about the underlying concept. And with that concept, you can go very far back into humanity's history. We've always wanted to communicate stories in this in such an immersive way. We've just never had such a powerful tool in our history before. Instinctively, I feel like this could be a good space for like a, a little uh, indie outfit, you know, a, a little uh, indie startup to sort of break out, do something that uh, another company, big companies are not willing to risk doing to sort of really disrupt. Uh, would you would you agree with that? And have you seen anything like that happening? Definitely. If with this medium, because there are a lot of naysayers and a lot of pessimists out there, that naturally means that not everybody's looking at this, which means there are opportunities for those who believe in it to really push the envelope and start developing things uh, that could go mass market. Now, I'm kind of straddling two worlds here. I'm thinking about the business market and I'm thinking about the consumer market. But to give you brief examples from both of those areas, think about um, a, an organization like, uh, like Striver. Uh, it's an organization that came out of Stanford University, and uh, they are now working with large organizations like Walmart and uh, the Bank of America. Um, and they have deployed 
training for virtu- using virtual reality hardware to these organizations in a massively scalable way. I'm talking about um, you know managing 20,000 headsets almost um, across Walmart's workforce to ensure that employees get the best training experience. That's one example from the, uh, from the enterprise world. From the consumer world, think about the, um, the, the outfit from uh, Czech Republic and they created a game called uh, Beat Saber. And I mentioned this um, mm. a little bit earlier. Uh, the company is called Beat Games. And it was started in, um, or, or Beat, Beat Saber itself was released in, in 2018. But the amazing thing is they had an idea. They saw how uh, exciting this medium was. And they created a virtual reality rhythm-based game um, uh, for, for virtual reality. And it has turned out to be an absolutely uh, incredible hit and it's become so um, so impactful, actually, in the world that they've made appearances in all these different shows out there. Um, Facebook has uh, bought the, um, the the organization itself, so they bought uh, uh, Beat Games in November 2019, and um, they're continuing to operate in in Prague now. But uh, the fact is, they've je- they've created they've gained so much um, fame. Um, money, funding from from pushing this envelope and taking a risk that it's just it shows you the 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 sort of the uh, the amazing returns you can get if you invest in this space and you can get it and you get it right. As a developer myself, I find myself you know getting bored a lot, and that that almost is one of my big biggest motivators to keep learning new things or you know move into a new role. Uh, is this is this a good space to get into if you're if you're bored? Is this a good investment in your future? Personally, I think this is an incredibly exciting technology, and I'm not a developer myself, but I gain excitement just by experiencing it. I gain excitement by evangelizing it and and seeing other people's reactions to it. Um, I can only imagine as a developer, you you would be even more excited by the prospect at creating such mm. virtual worlds and seeing such visceral reactions from the software you've created. Because obviously, depending on which which part of software development you're in, you don't necessarily get people gawping in awe you know, at the new website you've created or, uh, no. or the new <laughs> application uh, that you've released on, uh, on a mobile phone. But with, with virtual reality and augmented reality technology, you genuinely can see that sense of awe in the audience that you're building for. And is there any advice on uh, software or even hardware or skills that people should be picking up now? Yeah, so I'd say that when it comes to skill set areas in, in XR, there are three main areas. There is the business side, the creative side, and the technology side. And depending on where you your skill set most fits currently or where you want to go, you might choose one of those different areas. So as, as a person involved on, on the business side, it's important to really get to grips with the technology, understand uh, what it can do from a business perspective, understand the, the arguments around return on investment, thinking about how to build that picture, project managing um, such large projects where you have such a diverse range of skill sets available. When it comes to the creative side, this is more about the, the 3D artistry, uh, the concept art, the graphic design, the script writing even potentially, uh, and moving into a particular realm of virtual reality 360 video as well. There are lots of skill sets under that technology as well. And then on, on the tech side itself, you've got um, software development, you've got QA or quality assurance. And when it comes to software development, the two big engines uh, that are being used for for XR right now are Unity and Unreal. Definitely worth uh, getting under the hood of those technologies, thinking about how to use use them. But also bearing in mind that if if you are already well versed within those those engines and those software packages, it's also important to recognize that this is a completely different medium and one that has a different set of rules, a different set of ramifications for people when they experience it. So it's important to recognize that it is a partly different world at least. So you'll have to be flexible and adaptable in terms of picking up the relevant skills 
within those packages that relate to delivering a virtual reality and augmented reality experience. One area I'd particularly mention, though, as an area of interest that I think is really up and coming, even within the up and coming space of, of XR, is WebXR technology. Check that out. Have a look at it. Um, there, are, there are a few frameworks available for that right now. Um, and there are lots of applications being built. There are lots of authoring platforms out there. But in a nutshell, WebXR is about developing virtual reality and augmented reality applications that don't need to run, uh, that don't need to be downloaded by the end user as a separate application and installed and so on. They run off your web browser and, and are brought to the consumer uh, through that um, uh, through that medium, which is which is really helpful from a friction perspective, because you want mm -hmm. you want your end users to be able to access your application as quickly and as easily as possible, and WebXR really facilitates that. So I see that as being a big growth area for uh, in the technology space within XR. I'm not a games developer, but I have dabbled in Unreal, and um, it's incredibly easy to make a VR game in Unreal, actually. They make it. They make it quite easy nowadays, and there's far more support than there ever ever has been. And it's not only the game engines themselves that are building out this uh, uh, these frameworks and these libraries and making it easy for you, but also the communities around Unreal and Unity are really helpful. There are lots of tutorials out there. There are lots of forums. There are a lot of people willing to provide advice and help. Uh, and there are many um, more formal courses and workshops and. Uh, training sessions and the like. So there's a lot of support out there if you want to dig into it, and I, I wouldn't shy away from it um, if you're thinking about it. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff out there for you to dip your toe into and give it a go. And there's a lot of very friendly and knowledgeable people out there, such as yourselves, who um, uh, I'm sure would be happy to help. Absolutely. So on that topic, you're a member of uh, an organisation called ImmerseUK.org. Can you tell me a little bit about this? Yeah, sure. So Immerse UK is, in a nutshell, the, the UK government's representative body for virtual reality and augmented reality. And they, they are there to promote cross-collaboration across different stakeholder groups within the XR space. So if you think about all the people involved uh, in XR, you've got academia that are researching the technology, you've got... Uh, government that are providing incentives for, for innovative activities um, and projects using technologies like XR. You've got the end users themselves, the consumers, the buyers that are purchasing and experiencing the technology and contributing to the economy in that way. You've got the headset manufacturers building the technology. You've got the software developers building the content and the platforms that sit on that technology. There are all these different groups here. And it's really powerful when they all come together to, to make a difference, to share their knowledge, to share their learnings. And that is one of the key facets of what Immerse UK is about. It's about bringing all of these groups together, particularly in the UK, uh, to try and grow the immersive industry, promote it, make those links, uh, and ultimately accelerate it at a faster pace than would be possible without such an organization. PwC, where you've had a long tenure, are, are very big on DNI, diversity and inclusion. I know they're basically the top of the ladder in terms of social mobility. Um, are there specific opportunities uh, in XR if you're coming from a DNI background? Definitely, definitely. Um, I would say that the there's opportunities if you're coming from a DNI background to enter the XR space, and that's a really beautiful thing because the XR space is so new it doesn't necessarily have all of this, this baggage that a lot of established industries have, uh, have got that we've got to try and battle through to, to promote greater diversity and inclusion. The XR industry has been on point with this from the beginning, and it's not, it's not perfect, admittedly. There's still much work to do, but it is in a much better space. And from what I've seen, it is a much more open industry than, than many. Um, and is certainly welcoming to to many uh, from different and, and diverse backgrounds. So there's a lot of opportunity there. I can speak from from personal experience in uh, in PwC. Whenever we have an an opening and a role, we are always keen to to work with different communities that promote uh, DNI and promote diverse individuals to to make an application so that we can be 
we can be better in terms of bringing <clears throat> those diverse individuals on board into PwC. So if you look at the, the XR team um, in, in the UK, we are 50% women and one third people of color. So we're getting there in terms of building out this, um, this diverse profile. And, uh, you know, we're certainly not going to be complacent. We're, con- we're going to continue uh, to to do better, to be better, to take on board um, the latest thinking and, and progress in this field. And it's, of course, not only about race and, and gender. You know, diversity encapsulates a, a large uh, facets of, of different people's uh, characteristics and backgrounds from um, accessibility perspectives to neurodiversity and so on. And that's important to remember as well. I think um, we tend to promote uh, gender and race. That tends to be a very hot mm-hmm. in the DNI space and very keen to progress forward. But I think it's also important that we don't leave um, other, uh, other backgrounds, other experiences um, behind as well. Mm, absolutely. Well said. Now, um, we uh, recently reconnected after a six-year hiatus uh, when we started uh, discussing fun stuff you can do with XR. I think we were talking about VR games. Um, what, what kind of fun stuff are you doing now? Ah, fun stuff. Um, do you mean from uh, an enterprise perspective, business world, or do you mean in the, in the consumer personal world? No, no, I'm done with hearing about businesses. I want to know about the consumer world. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. So um, I can tell you just uh, just this morning, I was I was on my uh, Oculus Quest Two, and uh, I was playing um, a uh, a game called Creed: Rise to Glory. Now, if anyone has has played that or recognizes that, you'll know that that was a release title for the original Quest One. So it's a fairly old game now. But the reason I still play it is because it's really exciting. Like it gets the it gets the blood pumping, gets the heart rate up. It's a boxing game ultimately, but it makes you feel you're you're in like a a, a, a Rocky movie or something, and you know you're on your last legs. You know you're fighting in, you're struggling. But, you know, you're going to recover and you're going to send that fighter to the ground. You've got that real sense of, uh, of theater as well as fun with the game as well. And uh, it's a fantastic fitness tool um, on top of all of that. So not only are, are you having fun, but you're also, um, you know, exercising at the same time, which is very difficult to do and very... It's important to try and find some motivation with with fitness. It's something I struggle with personally. So virtual reality fitness and making it a bit more fun certainly helps. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of creative and artistic outlets as well, like Google Tilt Brush. The whole concept of virtual reality and, and art, these two worlds combining, I find it absolutely amazing because if you think about it, art... Art takes many forms, right? It could be paintings using different media. It could be um, it could be art on on a computer, digital art. It could be line drawn art, um, and there are so many different facets of it. But virtual reality really adds a completely different dimension to the art world in that it allows you to create something in true three dimensions or what feels like true three dimensions because you can walk through it you can you can look at it from different angles you can increase the scale of it you can be totally immersed in that world and this has actually born an entire new field around the vr artist so there are already a number of virtual reality artists out there that uh, that do um, that create virtual reality art, and uh, you know they're making a living out of it, which is which is such an amazing contribution to the world and a beautiful combination of technology um, and and art to bring together something completely new and, and innov- innovative. Thank you so much for your time. I really really appreciate it. I know how much in demand you are, um, and uh, thank you for everything you've had to say. That's really been amazing and very enlightening. The pleasure has been all mine, Sand. So uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And I look forward to the uh, the next one. You know, before I let you go, I need the joke of the show. Did you hear the rumor about butter? No. Well, I'm not going to spread it. Hey. <laughs> Beautiful. Perfect. Thank you, Jeremy. No worries at all, Sand. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully stick, I'll, stick. Get, I'll, I'll get another chance to, uh, to tell a dad joke again. Another time. Yeah, sure. 100%. You can tell all the dad jokes you want. <laughs> and that's all, folks. Thanks a lot for tuning in. 
For more info, for questions, comments, or feedback, please head on over to aheadintech.com and don't forget to subscribe.